Morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Wednesday Samuel to Chronicle study. We're in 1 Kings 14, 13 today. And we're gonna, before we get started, we're gonna have Loretto lead us in a prayer. Yeah, our Lord God, we are thankful that we are able to come today and join our friends and to study thy word on Kings. We pray that you open up our hearts with the great understanding that we'll be able to follow your word and know your will. We ask that you be with those that are sick, that are mentioned, so that they will be able to recover. And we pray that you be with them as well. We pray that you guard our hearts and minds that we will be able to understand your word as we are your people. We are so thankful for this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 14, and we're down here. Let me grab my Bible. Sorry about that. Uh, not that I use it, but it makes me feel comfortable with that. <laughs> Let's turn uh, And so we're, we're looking at Kings, and remember that we are... We are right. We are, we are right here. We just finished talking about Jeroboam, and we're going to get into Nadab in just a minute, and we're going to talk about Rehoboam and Abijah. And so we're covering in, in our lesson. Now, if you take a look at your at your lesson sheet, which is lesson eighteen, um, in your in your notes, that would be page sixty one. And notice your little outline there that we have Jeroboam was warned in chapter 13 that we covered. Uh, then in chapter 14, we have Rehoboam reigns in Judah, and that's what we were looking at. And then we noticed uh, that during that time, he had that, that um, prophet come and talk with him. And basically, you had the story of the prophet who showed up and told Jeroboam that because of his sin, the altar was going to be torn, was going to be ripped in half member. And then... Um, um, Jeroboam stretched out his hand and said, arrest him, and his hand withered, and, and then he asked the prophet to pray for him, and it was restored, and he told the prophet, you know, come and stay up, uh, come and, and let me give you something to eat and reward you, and the prophet said, no, I'm not supposed to eat or stay here, or receive anything, or drink water, I'm supposed to go back a different way, he goes back a different way, and then he, uh, somebody comes and talks to him, who comes and talks to him? Uh, another old prophet, and the old prophet, however, lied to him and said he could come eat, and so we notice that that prophet ends, ends up uh, dying, and, and uh, that's, kind, that's kind of where we're at. So we're over here in Kings chapter 14, and you have this prophecy against him, and in verse um, 14, after, after talking about the prophecy that was going, going to happen to him, um, it says in verse 14, moreover, the, the, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the house of Jeroboam. Uh, that will cut off the house of Jeroboam uh, this day and, and from now on. For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he will uproot Israel from its good land, which he gave to their fathers, and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River, because they have made their, their Asherim, provoking the Lord to anger. He will give up Israel on account of the sins of, Re of Jeroboam, which he committed and with which he made Israel sin. Then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to uh, Terza. As she was entering the, the threshing hold of the house, the child died, and all Israel buried him and mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he, which, uh, he spoke through his servant Ahijah. And so as, as we looked at this, we noticed that that uh, Jeroboam's son was sick, and so Jeroboam sent his wife to Abijah, who was the prophet from uh, Israel, and, or from Judah, sorry. Uh, there's Ahijah right there. And so he came to, to, to Ahijah, uh, and, oh, sorry, Abijah. Uh, there he is, sorry, down here. There's Abijah down there. See, that's why I like his chart up there. So uh, Abijah's down here. He's a prophet in Judah. Remember, Jeroboam was up in the, in the north, and so when his son got sick, rather than looking at the false prophets that he had and the, the false priests that he set up, 
he, he needed to go to Abijah, who was the prophet that, at, that uh, said he was going to be king. So he went to him to find out about his son. And basically, the, uh, Abijah said that, that the son was going uh, to die. Okay, But uh, I remember that, that I wanted to mention something in 1 Kings 14, 13 uh, about that before we get into 14. And that is, uh, in verse 13, when it talks about the child dying, he says, And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave, because in him something good was found toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. And so basically it says that this child is going to die uh, and that they're going to mourn for him. Now, what's interesting is the child was the son of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was being punished, but the child died. And somebody might think, well, why is God punishing the child because of what Jeroboam did? Well, first of all, God is not punishing the child because Jeroboam died. Uh, this isn't punishment on the child. This is just a consequence of what's going to happen to the child. Uh, uh, but the child isn't being punished. For example, if uh, I'm driving a car and I have my children in the car and I'm driving drunk and I run into a telephone pole and I die, okay, what, why am I dying? Because the consequence of my sin. Why are my children dying? Because they happen to be in the car that I was in when I died. That's why they died. They didn't die because of their sin. Okay. They just died because they happened to be in the car. And, and so that's what you have going on here. But the, the, also the thing I want you to understand is that he also says for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to his grave because in him something good was found towards the Lord. Now, individuals who have the, who have the idea that you're born in sin and you're born uh, 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 sinful uh, would have to say that there's nothing good in this child. But uh, God points out that there is something good in the child. And, and, and so therefore, just because uh, we're born into the world doesn't mean that we're automatically sinners or we're automatically lost. God finds good things in us when we're innocent. And so just wanted to point that out. So now, uh, as, as Abijah is talking to, to the wife of Jeroboam about her son, he says, moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the house of Jeroboam this day and, uh, and from now on. And so God po basically points out that there's going to be another king that's going to come, and this king is going, is going to kill Jeroboam and ruin his house. Now, remember that uh, you had Jeroboam's uh, lineage, you might say, that just lasted till right there. And then you have another, uh, another dynasty after that. So up in the northern kingdom, you had a bunch of dynasties. In the southern kingdom, you only had the one, which was the, the dynasty of David. This, all, all of these people are related to David somehow. And so they're in his dynasty. But up here, you have different dynasties, or in other words, different families that take possession of the, king, of the kingdom as the other king dies or becomes assassinated. And, and so that's what you have going on there. And so he says he's going to cut off Jeroboam this day. So one of the things that he says is that Jeroboam is, himself is going to come to an end, and his dynasty is going to come to an end. And then it says in verse 15, For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he will uproot Israel from this good land, which he gave to their fathers, and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River, because they have made their uh, Asherim, provoking the Lord to anger. Now, one of the things that God had told them in Deuteronomy was, in Deuteronomy 29, that when uh, they become disobedient to God, God is going to cast them out of their land. In Deuteronomy 29, in verse 28, it says, And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and in great wrath and cast them into another land as it is this day. And so God, God points out that there, that Israel, whether you want to talk about Israel as the 10 northern tribes, or whether you want to talk about Israel as the whole group with Judah included, their, their possession of the land was always conti contingent. It was contingent on them believing and trusting God. The reason why he's casting them out and the reason that he's casting out Israel is because not just Jeroboam did these things. It wasn't just Jeroboam who did this. Jeroboam started these things. He started the, the uh, pagan uh, 
um, uh, idols that were set up in Dan and Bethel. He started it, but Israel followed him. And so just because your leader does something doesn't mean that you can follow him and you're going to be okay. We're each going to be responsible for what it is that we each do. And that's the reason why in the scriptures, God doesn't put anybody over us. There's no society over us. There's no organization over us. There's no, there's no president over us. There's no pope over us. Uh, it's between us and God. There's people in God's church that help us in our relationship with God, but they're not over us. They don't rule over us. They're just helping us as and leading us as shepherds do. And so notice that the reason why he's going to destroy Israel isn't just because he's mad at at Jeroboam, but it's because in verse 15 at the end, because they have made their Asherim provoking the Lord to anger. In other words, they liked it. They liked following the, the Asherim. They liked not having to go all the way down to eat, uh, all the way down to Jerusalem in order to worship. They liked the convenience of it. And that's, that's uh, uh, what a lot of people like about some churches or some religions. It's a religion of convenience. It's easy. They, they don't expect much from you. They don't, they, they don't want much from you. Just show up and give us your money. And that's all they're really concerned about. They're not concerned about your personal life. They're not concerned about your, your uh, uh, godly purity. They're not concerned about any of those things. They're only concerned about you showing up and acting like uh, you're, uh, you know, like you're in a right relationship with God. And that's the problem with, with a lot of religions. And those, those are the religions that don't require much of their people. And it becomes just things that they do because of convenience. Verse 16 says, and he will give up Israel on account of the sins of Jeroboam. And when he says on account of the sins of Jeroboam, that means that as Jeroboam set up Dan and Bethel, the, the north people, the, the people in the north, they continued with it even after Jeroboam died. So God isn't saying that I'm punishing all of Israel because Jeroboam sinned. He says, I'm punishing all of Israel because Jeroboam sinned and you followed him. You did what he did. You, you, you were involved in the things he was involved in. He says, which he committed and with which he made Israel sin. Verse 17, then Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terza. As she was entering the threshing hold of the house, the child died. And so that's, uh, uh, again, an indication that Abid, uh, uh, Abijah or Abijam, the, the prophet, was actually a real prophet. Because how do you know how do you know a real prophet from fake prophet? Whatever they say comes true. Uh, Abijah said that when Jeroboam's wife uh, passed through the threshold of her house, that the child would die, and that's exactly what happened. I've often wondered uh, if if God said that to me for some reason, I probably wouldn't go home. You know, but it's kind of interesting. You kind of wonder, you know, what would happen if you don't go home? Uh, now, in verse 18, it says, And all Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant Abijah the prophet. And so basically, uh, what Abijah said uh, would happen happened. Now, what that tells you then is not just that. Uh, Jeroboam's child was going to die, which he did. It doesn't just tell you that. It also tells you that everything else Jeroboam said was going to happen. Okay, Jeroboam, I'm sorry, everything that, that uh, Abijam said to Jeroboam was going to happen. Uh, 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 Abijam doesn't have to do a sign for each individual event that's going to happen to Israel. He just simply does one to prove that what he's saying is from God. And so we're supposed to take the rest of what he says as coming from God when he says this is from God. And so that's, that's one thing I want us to, to understand. So, you, you know, once a prophet has been revealed to you as a prophet, once he's done something that proves that he's got a connection with God, you don't have to keep asking him over and over and over and over. That's kind of the problem with some of the charismatic churches where they believe that that. God has to keep doing miracles and God has to keep uh, giving them signs and God has to keep doing these things because if God doesn't, then they really can't trust him. But that's not true. If, if the apostles did miracles, uh, then you can believe the apostles. And, they don't, and God doesn't have to keep doing miracles in order for you to follow the apostles. 
The apostles already did miracles. The apostles already proved they spoke from God. And so therefore, just do what the apostles told you to do, and you'll be doing what God says. And that's the reason why the New Testament is filled or has numerous miracles in it that indicate that both Jesus did them and also that the apostles did them. Because that's how God verifies and proves who, who it is that's talking for him. In second in Hebrews chapter 2, and in the middle of verse 3, he says, after it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit. So those people who heard the Lord speaking are the people you and I follow. And those people that we follow, we follow because God gave them witness that they had the Holy Spirit when they did signs and miracles and wonders. And so I want us to understand that that's the reason why we follow the Bible. And that's the reason why we aren't so keen on any other religious books, because none of the other religious books really prove that they're from God or have miracles that you can look at and go, we know they're from God and you can verify them. So it says all Israel buried him and mourned for him according to the words of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant, Ahijah, the prophet. Now, verse 19. Now, the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he made war and how he reigned, behold, uh, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings uh, of Israel. And so the, he talks about the fact that there are some uh, 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 other records that, by the way, we don't necessarily have. And when he says uh, Chronicles here, he's not necessarily talking about the book of Chronicles. He's just talking about uh, uh, Chronicles as in the like you chronicle somebody's history so there's there's uh, uh, other books but uh, not necessarily everything that it says here or that that um, Jeroboam did was a recording what, what was recorded in what we call a second chronicles matter of fact if you look at your paper there your notes that you have on page what page was that lesson 18 there if you page 61 if you look at those notes you notice that it says Jeroboam was warned disobedience to the prophet Jeroboam's rule, and then you have Rehoboam. And so in, in Jeroboam, Jeroboam ruled, and you notice over in the second chronicle section, there's nothing listed there. See how there's nothing listed there in second chronicles? Okay, that tells you that uh, second chronicles is not this chronicle that they're mentioning over here about the rest of his works being written in the chronicles of Israel. I hope you all understand that most rulers had somebody who chronicled their history, right? Most rulers do, but not all of them were inspired. And so I just want, want to point that out to you in case maybe you're wondering why there's no references over here in Second Chronicles to Jeroboam, to this section that we're reading about here. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, it says, and the time he reigned was 22 years, and he slept with his father and uh, Nadab, his son reigned in his place. So the one who comes after him is Nadab. He's right there. See that little Nadab there? He, he sl slides right into that, that slot there. That's where, that's where Na Nadab reigned. So, Jeru so Jeroboam reigned 22 years. So uh, 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 Nadab probably only reigned a little bit. That's why he's got that little sliver there. And by the way, these charts are up here if you, if you need them because they're easier to look at if you have them with you. So uh, basically, he dies, and Nabat, his son, reigns in his place. Now, uh, verse 21, we're going we're gonna to come down now to Rehoboam. So now we're going to talk about Rehoboam. We talked about Jeroboam, and he died. Now we're going to come down here, and we're going to talk about Rehoboam. Now, remember that while Rehoboam is reigning, uh, Jeroboam was alive for, for most of it. So you need to remember that it's not like Jeroboam finish uh, dies and then next comes Rehoboam down here in in Judah Rehob Rehoboam is ruling at the same time Jeroboam is but you and I can't see him at the same time so we have to do one at a time so now we're looking at Rehoboam's rule and you remember that that Rehoboam who reigned over Judah was the one who had the kingdom divided from him right all right so let's take a look at this verse 
uh, 1 Kings 14, 21. Now, now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. And Rehoboam uh, was, was 41 years old when he became king. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. And the city which, uh, and the, city which the Lord had chosen from, from all the tribes of Israel put his name there. And his mother's name was uh, Nama, the uh, uh, Ammonitus. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy more than all that their fathers had done with the sins which they committed. For they also built for themselves high places and sacred pillars and asherim on, uh, on every high hill and, and beneath every luxurious tree. There were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. And so uh, uh, basically you now have down here at Rehoboam. And as, as you mentioned, as we looked at Rehoboam, what, what I think is interesting is Rehoboam began to reign when he was 41 years old, right? 41 years old. When Rehoboam was going to be king, who did he consult with? He first consulted with the older people, right? So the older people had to be older than 41. Everybody follow me? So the older people had to be older than 41 because they're older people. The, the younger men would be his age. So if you're in your 40s, God considers you young. <laughs> you see, I figured that out. <laughs> but it's interesting that apparently his, the, the men that he uh, um, consulted with, the young men were about his age and they're, they're 41. So if you want to know what God considers an older person, it's not somebody who's in their 40s, okay? It's somebody older than that. And so I just thought that was kind of interesting. Now, he reigned 17 years. Uh, Jeroboam reigned 22 years. That's why his box is a little longer. Rehoboam only reigned uh, 18 years, or 17 years, sorry, in Jerusalem. Now, notice that he reigns in Jerusalem, the city which God chose for all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And he, he emphasizes that because... He still expected all of Israel, the 10 northern tribes, he expected these people up here to come down to Jerusalem in order to worship. You remember when, when God first picked out Jeroboam? What, what did Ahijah the, or, uh, Abijah the prophet tell him when he first picked him out? What did he tell him? There you go. He said, if you're faithful to God, even though you're a separate kingdom, I would establish your kingdom and I would establish your rule. So God expected them to come down to Jerusalem and worship. That's where God put his name there. And so it's interesting that he says he put his name there. Okay. Uh, and in the city which, which God uh, had, and that's where God put his name. Now, um, the idea of God putting his name there, what does that mean? Okay, that's where he would be. Okay, that's where he would dwell. He would be there, right? So when, when Jesus comes, Jesus comes in the name of the Lord. Who's dwelling in Jesus? God. Not just a little God, but God. The same God whose name is here in Jerusalem. We now have that God in Jesus. And that's why John 1, 1 says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And 14 says and the word became flesh. And so we have Jesus in, uh, or we have God in Jesus, and that's where God's name is, which is one of the reasons why when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus because we're, we're approaching God and his name is there. But in the, in the Old Testament, of course, his name was in the city, you might say, or in the temple. Now, verse 22 and Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to, to jealousy more than all that the fathers had done with the sins which they had committed. So uh, even though Jeroboam built those cities of refuge, of those cities of, of idolatrous worship down in Bethel, Rehoboam and his individuals weren't much better. They also provoked God to jealousy. Now, I want you to notice that it says he provoked God to jealousy. What's the idea of jealousy? Who gets jealous? Envious people, so God's envious? 
Oh, okay. Just checking. All right, so certainly you could say that maybe he was envious because they were worship, worshiping something else. Well, that's true, but I don't ever find any place that says God was envious. We do find him saying he's jealous. What's the difference between being jealous and envious? Maybe that's what I need to ask you. Jealousy is I have the right to it. Envy is I don't have the right to it. When I envy what you have, I don't have the right to what you have which is what makes it envy. Jealousy is, Katie belongs to me. If I see her kissing some other guy, I'm gonna get jealous. Now, if Sharon kisses some, other, some guy, I'm not gonna get jealous. Why not? Because she don't belong to me. So jealousy is, is an indication that God said, these are my people and look at what they're doing. Now, if they weren't God's people, he wouldn't be jealous. <laughs> But they're God's people. He says, you're my people. I'm jealous over you. That's why he's jealous, because we're his people. And that's what he's trying to, he's trying to help, uh, get them to understand. They provoked him to jealousy. They belonged to him, but yet, as Bill and some of you pointed out, they were more concerned about following the high places, the Asherim in verse uh, 23. Uh, and, and they, they uh, set up these idols in these places where, where it would be more convenient for them to worship than going down to Jerusalem. That's also the same thing that Jeroboam did, but with the exception that he had golden calves. But he, they also tried to make religion convenient and easy, okay? And if you're gonna worship God, you don't worship God because it's easy and convenient. You worship God because he uh, expects us to worship and he expects us to worship the way he wants us to, this particular case is that they weren't trusting him. They were more concerned about their own convenience. Now, verse 24, there, uh, there were also male cult prostitutes in the, in, the, in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the, which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. Now, why, why did, Israel, why did um, Judah uh, do all these things? Because they were being influenced by the nations. They're being influenced by the nations. The nations did them, and so they want to fit in. That's exactly what Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about that we covered on our, in our Sunday class when it says that we were dead in sins because we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is not working in the sons of disobedience. He said, we chose to live like the world. Well, that's the problem with Israel. They, they chose to live like the world, and so they were doing things that the world did, and they were thinking, it's okay, the world is doing it, so we can do it. Let's, let's us go ahead and do it, because the world is doing it, because uh, we need to fit into society anyway. We don't want to be too radical. We, we, we want to kind of fit in with what's going on, so let's do some of the things that they're doing. And that's what you have going on, and that's why God is upset with them. They had male cult prostitutes. Okay, and it's interesting that that's one of the things that God mentions. And of course, in our culture today, you have, uh, by the way, uh, uh, male cult prostitutes were, were considered uh, individual um, men who engaged in, in sexual activity with other men. And th that's the idea of the, of the cult prostitutes that are under consideration. These are male cult prostitutes. Uh, th these aren't just women. Okay, these, these are men. And, and it, it's, it's always uh, implied that it's the, the men who, who are, you know, hiring prostitutes, whether they're males or females, and that's what you got going on here. But it's interesting that in our culture, that's what you're seeing in some of the churches today. In some of the churches, you're seeing the approval of homosexuality and thinking it's okay. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you that, a, that an individual that has homosexual tendencies and is trying to live the right kind of life can't get to heaven, they can. They can get to heaven just like we are. But I'm talking about churches where they promote uh, active uh, homosexuality and, and individuals who are involved in living in that relationship and they act like they're okay. That's what you have going on today in some churches. And notice that's one of the things that he lists here as these individuals are engaged in those activities. 
because the, the, the Bible teaches whether you're heterosexual or, homo, or, or, or homosexual, you're not, you're not supposed to involve in certain, not supposed to be involved in certain sexual activities, uh, period. And so I, 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 we need to kind of understand that. Now, verse 24. Now, it happened in the fifth year uh, of, King Rehoboam's, uh, of King Rehoboam that uh, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. So, so, so Shishak comes up against him, okay? And um, I, I want you to notice that, well, let me just go ahead and read this little section here. And then I want to go over and read it from Chronicles, okay? But uh, let's take a look at it here first. In verse 25, it says, Now it happened in the, in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that uh, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the, of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and he took everything, even taking all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. So K King Rehoboam made uh, shields of bronze in their place and committed them to the care of the commander of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. Then it happened as often as the king entered the house of the Lord that the guards would carry them and would bring them back, uh, back into the guards room. Now, the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? The, uh, uh, there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his father in the city of David, and his mother's name was uh, Nama. The, the Ammonitus, and Ab Abijam, his son, becomes king in his place. So a couple of things real quick before we read the other one. So it tells that after he died, Abijam, his, his son, becomes king right there, right after him. So, and again, notice that his reign was real short, just like uh, Nadad's reign was real short, short up in Israel. Uh, but as, as you read this, it, it didn't say very much about uh, about. Um, uh, Rehoboam's uh, good activities, if you if you if you want to think about it that way. But I want you to go with me to Second Chronicles, and I want you to look at chapter twelve. And chapter twelve uh, deals with uh, some of some of what's going on here in Rehoboam's reign. So we get a little bit more information here as we're looking at Rehoboam. And it says in Second Chronicles twelve and verse one, when the kingdom of Rehoboam was established and strong, and he and all Israel with him forsook the law of the Lord. So, so there, there you have him forsaking the Lord. And it came about in King Rehoboam's fifth year, because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jer Jerusalem. So this tells you why Shishak came up against them, with 1,200 1, chariots and 60,000 horsemen. And the people who came with him from Egypt were without number, the Lubim, uh, Sukkim, and the Ethiopians. He captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. So Shishak went into the land and went as far as Jerusalem goes, okay? Uh, and it says, then uh, Shemshai, the prophet, came to Rehoboam and the princes of Judah who had gathered at Jerusalem because of Shishak. And he said to them, thus says the Lord, you have forsaken me, so I also have forsaken you to Shishak. And so basically the prophet comes and says, look, you have left God. So that's why this is happening right there. And um, there's that prophet we're looking at right there. So he's a prophet from Judah. Okay. And it says, um, verse six, so the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, the Lord is righteous. So Shishak was coming to fight against them. He had all this army. He, he had entered their territory all the way to Jerusalem. And the prophet comes and said, this is happening because you're sinning, because you're not listening to the Lord. And it says, they humble themselves and they said, the Lord is righteous. And in other words, they're saying God is right. God is right in what he's doing. We have forsaken him. Now look at verse 7. When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemai, saying, they have humbled themselves, so I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some measure of deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by means of Shishak, but they will become his slaves so that they may learn the difference between my service and the service of the kingdoms of the country. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem 
and took the treasure of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's palace. He took everything. He even took the gold seals which Solomon had made. And, and so, so basically what that's telling us is that the reason that um, Jeroboam finally got rid of Shishak wasn't because of his good military strategy. Why was it? Because he humbled himself. He repented. But even though he repented, God said, I'm going to let you suffer some consequences so that you'll learn what? Yeah, but you'll learn something else. I guess we didn't read it. I didn't read it good enough. I read it too fast. Look at verse 8. I'll read it slower. But they will become his slaves so, as, so that they might learn the difference between my service and the service of the kingdoms of the country. So why did God let Shishak? the king of Egypt, come up all the way to Jerusalem, but didn't destroy Jerusalem. God wants them to see the difference between serving God and serving the world. By the way, God still wants us to see the difference between serving God and serving the world. God wants us to understand the difference between doing what he says. Like, for example, God says, you need money, get a job. Go out and get a job. And God says, I'll bless you. Or you can beg out in the streets, or you can steal, or you can rob. And which of the two is better? Get a job. You might say, well, I make more money robbing and stealing. Yeah, but every day of your life, you're looking behind your shoulders. You're wondering if you're going to go to jail. You're wondering if you're going to get caught. You're not setting a good example. You're not being productive in society. That's what happens when you serve the world, when you serve God. God's going to help you. And God says, I'm allowing this to happen so that you know the difference between serving me and serving the world. See, a lot of people don't understand that difference. A lot of people don't understand the difference between serving the world and serving God. And until we do, we're not going to come really to God with our whole heart because we're, we're going to think that we're doing okay. We're going to think, I'm doing all right. I got a job. Why do I need, why do I need God? Why do I need church? Why in, the world, why in the world do I need Jesus to save me? I'm okay. And the problem is, is that we haven't seen the difference between serving the world and serving God. And that's what he wanted them to do. So, so what's interesting is that the book of, of uh, Kings doesn't necessarily list the good thing that Rehoboam did. And what's interesting is that uh, as we go through here, you're going to find out that every bad king has something that he does that's good, usually. And every good king has something that he does that's bad, usually. So it, it's, it's kind of interesting that when you look at that, that God deals with people the way we really are. Because even though we might generally be a good person, there's things in my life that I look back on, and I go, oh, I should, probably shouldn't have done that. And there's things, there's things that I've done even as a Christ, after a Christian that I say I regret doing it, okay? Because it hurt somebody or it caused difficulty. And so it's interesting that that's what you're going to notice as we go through here. Uh, all right, so now then, uh, back to 1 Kings. That's, that's what I wanted you to notice there about that section. Uh, and so you notice that in verse, in verse 30, in uh, 1 Kings 14, 30, it says, there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually, and Rehoboam slept with his father and was buried with his father in the city of David, and his mother's name was uh, Nama and uh, Ammonitus, and Abijah, his son, became king in his place. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is that God had told them not to intermarry with foreigners, right? But yet here, who is uh, Rehoboam's mother? Because she was one of Solomon's wives, right? And so it's interesting that you see that kind of influence from the, from the mom's side that, yes, sir? Sure. Yep. Yep. But, but there were still some of them around. Yep. I believe they were. The, the Ammonites, I believe, were, were one of the descendants of, of uh, Lot's daughters that had relationship with Lot. Yeah, I, I believe so. That's off the top of my head, so don't quote me. 
All right, now we're, we're now going to come to uh, Abijam's reign. And Abijam is down here. He's the one who took over from Rehoboam. So he's in the south. Okay, he's ruling over Jer Jerusalem and Judah and there. And that's, where, that's what we're going to look at next in 1 Kings 15. And that's, that's what we're going to notice in here. Uh, and it says in uh, verse, verses 1 through 8, let me just go ahead and read that to you, because if you notice, there's some stuff in Chronicles that I want to look at, because it gives us a little bit more detail. But 1 Kings 15, 1 says, Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Ab Abijam, became king over Judah. Now, that's kind of confusing. What he's saying is, in the 18th year of Jeroboam. Remember, he reigned 22 years. Rehoboam only reigned uh, um, 18 years or 17 years. And so during Jeroboam's 17th year of ruling, then you get a new king down here in, in Judah, who is uh, Abijam. Everybody kind of have that in your head a little bit? That, that's why that chart is helpful, I think. And it says in verse 2, he reigned three years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was uh, Maka, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had committed before him. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the, to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father David. He says, but, but, David's, uh, but for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Now, the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. And Abijam slept with his father, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa, his son, became king. So, here you have this real quick story about uh, Abijam, who is the prop, who is the king here. And over here, you have Asa. And Asa is going to rule for a long time, as you see there. But remember that this is during the time that Jeroboam is ruling and reigning. And that's why you have it there. Now, if we go over, if we go over to 2 uh, Chronicles um, 13, because in 1 King or 2 Kings, it does. Uh, sorry, 1 Kings, it doesn't say much about anything good that, that he did, okay? But take a look here at 1, 2 Chronicles 13.1. It says, in the 18th year of the king Jeroboam, uh, Abijah became king over Judah, and he reigned three years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was uh, Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel and uh, of uh, Gebeah. Now, there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. Abijah began, uh, uh, began the battle with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 chosen men, while Jeroboam drew up in battle form form formation against him with 80 800,000 chosen men who were valiant warriors. So who had, the, who had the most army? Jeroboam did, right? He had, twice, he had twice the size of an army. All right. Now, verse 4. Then Abijah stood on Mount uh, Zemmerahem, uh, which is in the hill country of Ephraim. And he said, listen to me, Jeroboam and all Israel. Do you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by the covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his master. And worthless men gathered about him, scoundrels who provoked uh, who proved uh, too strong for Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when he was young and timid and would not hold his own against them. So now you intend to resist the kingdom of the Lord through, uh, through the son, sons of David, being a great multitude and having with you the golden calves with, which Jeroboam made for gods for you. Have you not driven out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, and made for yourselves priests like the peoples of, of other lands? Whoever comes to consecrate himself uh, with a young bull and seven rams, even he, he may become a priest of, of what are no gods. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. 
and the sons of Aaron are ministering to the Lord as priests, and the Levites attend to their work. Every morning and evening they burn to the Lord burnt offerings, and fragrant incense and showbread is set on the, on the clean table, and the golden lampstand with its lamps is ready to light uh, every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Now, behold, God is with us uh, at our head and his priests with the signal trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O sons of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you will not succeed. But Jeroboam had set an ambush uh, to come from, from the rear so that Israel was in front of Judah and the ambush was behind them. Now, I want to stop there for just a minute, and I want you to notice what it is that, that um, Abijah uh, brags about. What is it that he brags about to Jeroboam? We have God, and we have the right priests, and we have the temple, and we're offering sacrifice, and we're offering the, the proper uh, way that God wants us to do it. Yet, what did we, what did we read about him in 1 first, in, uh, first Kings? That he was doing that Israel was doing the same thing. So basically, what you have here is you have basically the fact that that Abijah is basically saying, look, we're keeping the cultic religious practices. It's kind of like somebody saying, Well, you know, I go to a church and we take the Lord's Supper and we hear we hear the word of God. And we, we listen to what the word of God says, and we sing, and we don't even use instruments, and so I'm okay. What are they thinking? We're doing it, we're doing everything right. We got the cultic practices of the law right, and so we're okay with God. That's what that's what Jeroboam or that's what uh, Abijah was thinking. We're doing the cultic practice of the law, so we're okay, even though in First Kings it says that they sinned, okay, and he did worse than his father. So I just kind of, kind of want to point that out to you. Now, it says uh, in verse 13, but Jeroboam had set an ambush to come from the rear so that Israel was in front of Judah and the ambush was behind him. And when Judah turned around, behold, they, they were attacking both front and rear. So they cried to the Lord and the priest blew the trumpet. Then the men of Judah raised a war cry, and when the men of Judah raised the war cry, then it was that God routed Jeroboam and all Israel before uh, uh, Abijam and Judah. And when the sons of Israel fled before Judah, God gave them into their hands. And Abijah and his people uh, defeated them with a great slaughter, so that 500,000 chosen men of Israel fell. Thus the sons of Israel were, were subdued at that time, and the sons of Judah conquered because they trusted in the Lord, the God of their fathers. Now, why did this battle go, go uh, towards Abijah? Because what? Okay, because he trusted in God. And how was it that he trusted in God? All right. So, so every time we see God acting... We notice that God acts when they repent, when they change, and, and they decide to do what's right, then God, who is gracious and merciful, uh, works for them. And so it says in verse 19, and Abijah pursued Jeroboam and captured from him se several cities, Bethel and his villages, Je uh, Shanna with its villages, and Ephron with its villages, and Jeroboam did not again recover strength in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him and he died. But Abijah became powerful and took 14 wives to himself and became the father of 22 sons and 17 daughters. Now the rest of the acts of Abijah and his ways and his words are, uh, uh, are written in the treaties of the prophet uh, uh, Edu. Now, what I think is interesting is here you have this prophet, I mean, sorry, this king who reigned three years. But during this time, they found in, uh, I can't remember if it's in Israel or if it was in the land of the Ammonites, archaeologists dug up a, you know, some, 
some uh, uh, archives. And in the archives, they talked about the land of Judah being the land of Abijah. And so apparently he made such a impact that that area became known as his area uh, during that time. And so I, I, find, I find that interesting that that, that happened. So I, I hope what you're noticing is that as, you, as we go through kings, it generally doesn't list a lot of good things that happen to the kings that are mentioned there. Um, and it's kind of backwards because in Chronicles, you don't have a lot of good things mentioned about the, the uh, northern king, kings, but you find some things in first, in first Kings. So I think that's interesting the way they, they did that. Uh, in the book. Yes. Right. Right. No, because Dan is way up. Yeah, so so this was the, the, the low place or the, the southern place of Israel where the people in the south could go. And so uh, Abijah had gone up at least that far and captured it. But what I find interesting, since you brought that up, what I find interesting is it doesn't say that he tore down the altar. It doesn't say he tore it down. He, so he just left it. Well, okay. But he did yes, he did. Well, as far as we know, he didn't. And, and, and you know, we're still going to read about the, the idolatrous worship in Bethel as we read on later. But it's interesting that, that even though he had all those sins, God still listened to him and God rescued him. So it's never too late to turn to God. Uh huh. Well, uh, sure. A, a lamp would be all of these kings that are down here that come from the family of David. That's a lamp. In other words, it's still giving, still giving David's dynasty a little bit of light. That's what it means by the lamp in, in that case. And Jesus, of course, is the big lamp. He is the light. And so he's, he's, the, he's the actual person that's mentioned that is going to establish the kingdom. Yes. Yes, he's, he's keeping the, the Davidic dynasty alive on the bottom. And that, that's what he refers to when he talks about leaving him a light. Yeah, a, a light was considered your, your children. Who would carry on? Right, but the lamp, the lamp or a light, you know, the lamp gives light. So the, the idea is that my my light, my lamp is not extinguished. They had one candlestick. One candlestick. That, that light was referring to Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Had seven branches, but only one lampstand. Right. Uh -huh. uh, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, you have seven lampstands because that represents the individual churches that give, that give off the light of God. Okay. There you go. All right. Um, so let's see, where are we at over here in 1 Kings? Asa. Okay, now, ver now verse 9, 1 Kings 59. Uh, we have uh, Asa here. And it says, um, so in the, in the 20th year of Jeroboam, so remember that Jeroboam ruled 22 years. So you had one of those kings was Ab Ab Abijah in there. And now the next king's coming, and this is going to be Asa. But he starts his rule before Jeroboam ends his rule, right? Okay, it says, so in the 20th year of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, Asa became, uh, began to reign as king of Judah. He reigned 41 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was uh, Maka, the daughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. That's the reason why you have this white or clear there it's not dotted all of them that are dotted indicates that they're that they weren't really good godly kings so if you notice most of the kings in the, all of the kings in the north weren't very godly and then in the south you have a, 
quite a few that are godly, but you have some that are mixed in there that aren't. And towards the end, you get a bunch of ungodly kings in uh, Judah, reign over Judah. Now, verse 11 says, as D Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord, like David, his father. He also put away the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols which his, fa which his fathers had made. He also removed Maka, his mother, from being queen, queen mother because she had made a horrid image uh, as an Asherah. And Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it and burned it at the brook Kidron. And so one of the things that this tells you is this tells you uh, Asa's zeal for the Lord. He became king and he did what was right. And as he did what was right, God allowed him to live 41 years. Uh, God allowed him to reign 41 years. And he, he did what David, his father, did. He also removed the male cult prostitutes. And he removed the idols that his, fa that his fathers had put up. So his fathers, in this case, would not be David, but would be Jeroboam and uh, Abijam. Those would be Asa's fathers uh, in relationship to these idols, not David. He says he also removed uh, Maka, his ma, his mother. Now, she was the queen, and apparently she thought because she was queen, she could do whatever she wanted. And so she set up what's referred to as a horrid image in verse 13. It was an Asherah. And so a Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it at the brook Kid Kidron. And so ba basically, uh, Asa was, was uh, going to do what was right, even if it went against his mother. Okay, um, he, he was going to do what's right. And certainly there's a lesson in there that sometimes doing what is right demands that we leave our family values and follow God. And that's what's under consideration in Matthew chapter 10. And down here at about verse uh, 30, let's see, about verse uh, 32, I think. No, um, yeah, verse 34. Matthew 10, 34, he says, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own house. In other words, what God is saying is, is that when it comes to serving Jesus, we might have to put away our family values and what our family values because it's not conducive to serving God, and our families might get upset with us and get mad at us. And so my father might get mad at me because I'm not a, a Catholic. He didn't. But my, you know, your, your parents could get mad at you when you tell them that you're no longer Catholic, and your Protestant family might tell you that you know, uh, they might get mad at you when you tell them you're not Protestant, that you're just simply trying to follow what God says. And so the, the question is, are, are we willing to to follow God, uh, no matter the consequence and the, and the cost, and Asa was. Now verse 14, but the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days. Now, you can do your best at trying to um, make sure that your house is run properly, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get the, the, the heart felt approval of the people who live in your house. You, you might put away all sorts of stuff in you, from your house and not let your family do it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your family will wholeheartedly agree with it, okay? And that's the king's problem at this time. And so verse 15 says, he brought, in, uh, he brought into the house of the Lord the dedicated things of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and gold and, uh, and utensils. Now, there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all, all their days. Now, Basha, king of Israel, was the king that comes after Nadab. Okay, Remember, there's Jeroboam, and then there was Nadab, and now there's Abisha. And so these two guys, Asa in, in Judah and uh, Basha in the north, they have conflict with each other. And that's what's under consideration uh, here as we're reading this. Uh, he says in verse 17, Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming in to Asa, king of Judah. And then Asa took all the silver and the gold which were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord, in the treasure of the king's house, and delivered them into the hands of his servant, 
and, the, the, and King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tib, uh, Tibramam, Mon, the son of uh, Hezion, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, let there be a treaty between you and me, as between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent you a present of silver and gold. Go break your treaty with Basic, king of Israel, so that he may withdraw from me. So basically what you have then is you have uh, that uh, uh, Basa comes and he makes some fortified cities, basically on the border between Judah and Israel, so that the people of Israel can't go down to Jerusalem to worship, and he's not letting the people from Judah go up. And so basically he put this, basically a fort there to keep, to keep that from happening. And so when, when that hap happened, then King Asa decided he needed to do something because apparently um, um, Basa was getting too strong for him. So uh, Asa basically goes and he pays Ammon, who is ruling in Damascus, to break his treaty with, with Basa so that he'll be less powerful and, and won't come against Asa. And so uh, that's what he, he did by sending him the treasury. So he, he took the stuff that, that was the treasury that he had, and he basically bought a, 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 some mercenaries to break their treaty with uh, 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 so that, or, uh, Basha so that he could have a little bit of, of relief. And we're going to notice that when we read in Chronicles, what God thought about that. But we're going to have to stop here at verse 19. Any questions or anything? Yes. Right. When Israel went off into captivity and when Judah went off into captivity, one of the things that God says is when, when Judah comes back, they will never again worship idols. And it's interesting that as you read the history of Israel, from the time they came back out of captivity to the time of Jesus, Jesus never talks to the Pharisees, the scribes, and says, you guys follow idols. He never, he never mentions them following idols. They followed wrong principles and wrong ideas, but they didn't follow idols. And so the, their, their, their idolatrous worship basically ended when they went off into Babylonian captivity. And so they, when they came back out, the, the nation, as, as the nation, didn't worship idols anymore. All right, anything else? All right, let's go ahead and have a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for the stories that you tell us, especially for those of us, Father, who happen to be the, as we often say, the king of our castle. Help us to understand our ability to rule and our ability to govern in such a way, Father, that we help our, our family and we help our friends to come to serve you, Father. Help us to put away from us those things that are not beneficial for the development of your people and for ourselves. We pray that you help us, Father, when we understand our sin and our shortcoming, that we repent. And anytime you put us in situations where we need to call on you, Father, we pray that you help us to call on you and not on our own strength. And so we praise you and thank you for these stories that help us to see your care for us. And we praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. And we are